Paul continues his letter to the church at Philippi and really writes one of the most well-known chapters in all of the epistles, and he talks about Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith and the mindset that we're to have, the mindset that looks like Christ. It's so beautiful. I, I can't... I, Let's just get into the word. It's so good. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. How? By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. He says, this is how you will bring me joy is that you're united in Christ. Be united in your love for Christ. Be united in your tenderness and compassion to one another. Don't allow the enemy to divide you. There's so much divide that takes place throughout the world, but Christ is the unifier. Christ came to unite us What under him. We are the body of Christ, but he is the head. He is the leader of the church. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't have an unhealthy motivation. Don't have a pride. Don't have a selfish ambition, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves. You want to be like Jesus? Put people first. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Put people first. Put others first and watch. God will take care of all the details. Believe me, if you sow that good seed, you will reap a good harvest. Something I want to share with you that I told a friend the other day. I said, when I go into relationships, I used to look to be poured into. But I'm learning now when I go into relationships that I want to look for relationships that I can pour out into. Because I want to pour out what I have, trusting by faith that God will fill me back up. I want to be poured into by God. I want my cup to runneth over like David talked about in the Psalms. I want him to fill me up. And I know that you do too. He said, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Where he said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God or being, did not consider it equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Basically, what Paul's saying is Jesus is God. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. Hebrews 1 tells us that God at various times in various ways spoke to us by, our, by the fathers and the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the world. Jesus is God. He said, even though He is God, He didn't use it to His own advantage, but rather He made Himself nothing. He emptied Himself is what he did. By taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, heaven gave its best to earth. In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Jesus went low and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. He became obedient unto death. He was so obedient that he would rather die than be disobedient to the Father. Even death on a cross, even a shameful death. He was willing to die a shameful death rather than be disobedient to the Father. And you might say, well, well, he wanted to go on the cross. Listen, his flesh did not want to go on the cross. There's things that my flesh don't want to do that I know that I need to do. You say, no, 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 Jesus wanted to. If Jesus' flesh wanted to, he wouldn't have said in the garden, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Yes, was it in Jesus' heart to die for us? Yes. But his flesh did not desire to go be whipped, beaten, bruised, and abused and go on the cross because it was going to be painful. There's things in our life that our flesh does not desire to do. But just like Jesus, we have to train our flesh to push through and to press through the things that we don't want to do. It's in Hebrews. My mind says it's Hebrews chapter 5. It says that though he was a son, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. It doesn't mean that Jesus was disobedient. He was obedient. But there were things that he walked through. 
as he learned what it looked like to be obedient when he put on flesh just like us. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest of places. So many people in our world are looking to lift themselves up, looking to exalt themselves, but Jesus didn't do that. He waited on God. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue would acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and all will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by that because he is our Lord, and he's the model. This is the manual. The Bible's the manual, and Jesus is the model for the mindset that we're to have. He says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It is God who works in you and through you. Both to will and to do in order or in according to his good pleasure, your translation may say. God is at work in our lives. And he wants to act and operate through us to fulfill the plan that he has. And Paul would tell us in verse 14, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Don't be complaining. Don't be a... Don't be a sensitive Sally, if you will. Don't always, don't always be complaining. Don't always be grumbling. Don't always be murmuring. Don't be like the children of Israel who are murmuring through the wilderness. Do things with a good attitude so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. You need to shine in a dark world. I need to shine in a dark world. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. He goes, I want to shine in a dark world. But even if this darkness takes my life, even if my life has to be given for the gospel, he goes, that's okay. He goes, I want you to rejoice with me and for me. He saw it as a privilege to suffer for the Lord. In verse 19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him, nobody like him, who will show you gen- who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. He said, most people, they're consumed looking out for themselves. But you know that Timothy has proven himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. He says, I'm going to send you Timothy. He's a young son in the faith who has my heart. He's a young son in the faith who's a good, godly man. And I'm going to send him ahead of me, and I hope to join you soon. Verse 25, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill. He was sick. He almost died. This was someone that they had sent to come help and aid Paul. And he was sick and he almost died. But God had mercy on him, not on him only, but also on me to spare me my sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm excited. I'm eager to send him to you so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. This man that you sent to me, he risked his life and he gave his all to come serve. He was was a fellow missionary with Paul. He was a missionary that the church sent out from Philippi to come minister to Paul and with Paul. And even though he was sick, he continued on his journey. And Paul said, it's my joy to send him back healthy and whole because God preserved him, but also so that um, he can be with you and that you can be encouraged. And he really talked to them about how he was going to send them Timothy and Epaphroditus. And that's more personal to that church, but I believe that what's more practical and applicable to us is what took place earlier in the chapter when he talked to us about the mindset that we need to carry as Christians and as a church. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. I want my mindset, I want my approach, I want my will to bend to the will of the Father just like Jesus. I don't wanna look to exalt myself 
I want to look to exalt Christ. I want to humble myself. And I want to be so obedient to God that disobedience just turns me off. I want to trust God in everything, even if it's uncomfortable. Trusting that in due time, he'll make something beautiful out of me. I'm going to finish where we started in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work is faithful to complete it in my life, in your life, in our lives, because that's the God that we serve. Be blessed today.